I propose crystal plating on all ships. Ah, uh, then perhaps I could prepare a few pieces of armor. Which would you prefer? Both? Both. Both. Both is good. My lord. My lords. And so dawns the age of the crystal hull plate. <sighs> Happy New Year. <laughs> Armor or hull plating? An age old question. But which should we put on our ships? Well, let's dive in and find out. In Stellaris, ships come with a number of utility slots, and in those slots we can fit defensive components. Now, there are three main types of defensive components we've got shields, and they'll add shields to our ship. We've got armor, which will add armor to our ship. And then we have hull plating. And hull plating is a bit of a weird one because it will increase the overall hull points or health points of your ship. Different types of utility defense components add protection to your ship against different types of weapons. So we're not really going to be looking at shields in this video and, and the counter there. What we are going to be looking at is hull plating or armor. Now the reason for that is shields are really good, they're really useful, they're relatively cheap at half the alloy cost of armor plating which means our ships with shields are cheaper to produce. So generally, you'll probably want to fill your ship up with as many shields as your reactor can allow, and then you'll be left over with some slots. And we can either put armor or hull plating into those slots. But which one should we pick? So what I've done is I've done a series of tests where I've pitted fleets with identical weapons and the same ship class against each other and each fleet has either had armor plating or hull plating, crystal hull plating. And when I've done this battle analysis, I've had two main goals. I've either looked at having fleets of equal fleet size or fleet capacity, that way we've got balanced numbers on both sides, or I've looked at the economic cost of the ships. Now, a crystal hull plating doesn't require any alloys to produce, it just requires rare crystal resource which is going to make our crystal hull plating ships cheaper. So for the same alloy or economic cost, we're going to be able to fleet field larger fleets of these crystal hull plating ships against our armor equipped ships. Something really important as well to say before we get into this is that armor benefits from repeatables. There's a repeatable engineering technology which can increase the hull points added to your ship due to the presence of armor. But crystal hull plating at this point does not benefit from any repeatable technology. So for the purposes of these tests, I am only looking at the first kind of 50 to 100 years of the game before we get to the period that we're going to be having repeatables. That's a separate analysis. I'm actually looking at doing a video on the effect of repeatables on our weapon technology and our weapon interactions. If you'd like to see that, comment down below and I will get on with doing some testing on that. But without further ado, let's jump in and have a look at some ship designs. First up, we've got a Corvette representing the kind of average Corvette you might expect to see in 2020 to 2030. Now, this Corvette, uh, because of the time period, I've only taken certain technologies, nothing really beyond tier three here. So we've got tier three armor and tier three shields on the armored variety, and then obviously hull plating on the crystal hull plating ship. Now we've gone for missile and auto cannon. This was pretty much the best Corvette in most of the Corvette tests I've done. If you wanna see any of those videos, you can check them out uh, down below in the description. I have a link to a playlist full of videos about different ship types and engagements. Important thing to note here is we are already at this early stage with only two crystal hull plates that are small and two armor modules that are small, seeing a difference in cost of around 35 to our two ships. The one is 175 and the other 141. I've also gone with missiles. Those missiles are going to be doing extra damage against hull rather than torpedoes, which do extra damage against armor. This would suggest on paper, we're going to see a balance in favor of the armor, but we'll have to wait and find out. And so next up, we've got some destroyers that you might see around 2030. 
These have a large and medium slot. They're very much anti-destroyer destroyers. So they've got either crystal hull plating or the armor, obviously. And then again, we've got tier three shields. I have gone for the tier four on the kinetic weapon and tier two on the plasma accelerator because I think that those two are a bit more likely to get to rather than somebody picking up the tier four shields or armor by this point, given that you'll probably be rushing for the weapons technology over the defensive technology. But that's a personal preference. I could have changed it around a little bit. We'll have to see how they do. Looking at cost difference here, there's a cost difference of over 50 alloys at this point, which for the crystal plating ships means that's about 20% of the value of the ship. To round off our early game batch of testing, I've also got a 2030 style cruiser. Now in this one, I've gone with the line combat computer. The reason for that is together with the line combat and the two auxiliary hit modules, we're going to end up with a 100% accuracy on the plasma weapons and 95% accuracy on the kinetics. If I'd gone for the tracking computer here, due to the low evasion of the cruisers, it really wouldn't have been useful because we've already got reasonable evasion on these two weapons. Now, we're going to see higher damage from the plasma to the hull and overall, on paper, this would look like we're going to be getting an advantage to the armored ships. That, those kinetic weapons are going to do reduced damage to the armor, but regular damage to the hull, whereas the plasma is going to do a little bit more damage to the armor than the hull, but overall that is sounding like an advantage for the armor chips. So what about some later game ships? So we've got some 2060 roughly destroyers here. They've got neutron launchers and level five kinetic weapons, as well as basically the max level on the defenses and the other auxiliary components. At this later stage, the economic difference is becoming quite pronounced. We're looking at a difference here of over 60 alloys per ship, which for one of these destroyer class ships is again, it's still around 20% of the value of the ship. Now on paper, because of the neutron launches and the kinetics, armor should come out firmly on top and ahead. Armor is going to get better defensive bonuses than those additional hull points that those ships are getting. But it's really important to note here that by increasing the hull points of the ship, yes, we are reducing a ship's fire output as they get damaged, but what we are doing as well is increasing the ability and chance that that ship will able, be able to disengage from combat when it gets below 50% health and therefore be able to continue fighting, continue the war. Because of course, a war isn't about a single battle, it's usually about a whole series of battles and coming out ahead on those. And finally, we've got kind of the standard battleship design that I arrived at through testing of the artillery type weapons and the X slot weapons. If you wanna see those videos, again, link down below in the description. But this is going to have three neutron launchers, a kinetic artillery, and then I'm also going to be trying out a variety of different X slots just for some, a little bit more data here, basically. I am going to be trying the Tachyon Lance, the Giga Cannon, and the Arc Emitter against both each other. And I wanna get a bit more data because some people complained about, well, what if we had the Arc Emitter coming up against Tachyon Lance ships with all armor and shields, or some uh, Giga Cannon ships with all armor and shields? Wouldn't the Tachyon, uh, the Arc Emitter do better? Well, I've done testing on that, and we will now have to find out. So how did these fleets do against each other? Well, when you had fleets with equal economic cost, the corvettes with the armor lost dramatically. Not only did they lose, but they took massive casualties, twice the casualties that the fleet equipped with crystal hull plating took. And this is basically down to the differing fleet sizes. So the armored ships, I could field about 65 of them for a total cost of 10,700 alloys. Whereas for the same number of alloys, I could get 80 corvettes with crystal hull plating. Now, of course, 80 corvettes are going to do better than 65. I've got an extra 15 weapon slots there. Uh, it's it's just, it's, uh, it's gonna be a real cakewalk. And that's, that's definitely what the numbers and the data reflected. Looking at just the losses specifically, 
the armored ships still took many, many more ship losses uh, in terms of actual numbers, not just percentages, than the crystal hull plating ships. On the other hand, once you get to a point where you've got equal fleet sizes, so that's both 80 ships apiece, the hull plating ships then lose. They didn't lose as badly as the armored ships did, but they were still a definite and costly defeat. Now the 2030 destroyers, so these had about 15,000 alloys per fleet to begin with, and that meant that we had about 50 armored destroyers against around 60. Now, for that first batch of tests, the economically balanced one, the destroyers with the armor lost again big time. Now this is again going to be down to the fact that you can field more weapons on more ships if you don't take that armor plating, if you just instead go with the crystal plating. Now, as you can see here, the losses to the armored destroyers was around 37%, quite a bit less than the corvettes. That's down to the extra disengagement chance that the destroyers had. But still, they are over double the losses we had from the crystal that they inflicted on the crystal plating ships. However, here, when we changed over to have fleets of equal size, yes, the crystal plating ships lost their engagements and were forced to retreat. But having said that, they inflicted almost equivalent casualties on the armored destroyers. So in this case here, it's clear that crystal plating is better economically and better if you're in a one-on-one -on -one straight up fight. For our cruisers, which are based in 2030, it was quite clear that the additional hull plating really reduced the overall losses that the cruisers were suffering. As you can see here, nobody really got around above 35% uh, for fleet losses after an entire engagement. Actually, the crystal hull plating, again, on an economic basis, did much better than the armor plating, as we've seen in the other tests. However, it did lose to the armor plating when it was fleets of equal sizes, pretty much the same as the others. But like destroyers, when it lost, it didn't lose as badly as when the armor plating lost. So what we can kind of see from this is that crystal plating, again, it's worth it because you're able to run more ships. As of course, Stellaris isn't getting a game just about warfare. The economic aspect of your empire is very important. In order to have a fleet in being to put ships into the field, you need to have the economic weight to back that up. And you need to use your resources to build a fleet. So a fleet that requires less resources, you can either build more ships or also get them back into the fight quicker because you're going to be able to replenish your fleets faster if they all have crystal hull plating even if they do lose those fights because they're cheaper to reproduce. The late game destroyers here, I had around 26,800 alloys per fleet, which ended up being 60 armor chips and about 73 crystal hull plated ships. Again, on an economic setting, just like the earlier destroyers, the hull plated ships did do better than the armored ships from an economic perspective, but because of the prevalence of the neutron launchers, which are really, really good against hull and not quite as good against armor, here in this case, it was quite clear that while you were getting more uh, casualties inflicted and you were overall winning the combat due to running more ships and then having a higher number of weapons, you were taking many, many more losses than in the previous version. So once neutron launchers come out, the effectiveness of crystal hull plating is somewhat diminished, though it is still, from an economic perspective, really good to go there. So starting off with the ship type that I kind of came out on top in previous tests, which is the artillery battleship with a giga cannon, three neutron launchers and a kinetic artillery, I pitted those against each other. So firstly, when you had an equal number of resources available, around 27,300 alloys, it is really a close fight between the armored battleships and the hull plated battleships due to the higher damage output from the neutron launchers. Now, interestingly, 
once you go to fleets of equal size, which is only going from 17 to 20 ships. Now using crystal hull plating at this point will only lose you three ships or 15% of your fleet size for the resource cost. But once you get to fleets of equal size, the giga cannon uh, ships completely eviscerated the crystal plated ships. That's partly because the armor plating at this point obviously has more hit points to it than the crystal hull plating is providing. Now, if you had something like crystal forged plating, which is much better, it's about 33% better, I want to say, than the crystal infused plating, this would be different. Of course, it's also important to note here too, we don't have any armor repeatables or weapon repeatables stacking yet. As those repeatables stack, armor is going to get further and further ahead in terms of its cost effectiveness. So by this late point in the game, if you are running Giga Cannon fleets against each other, running armor or hull is actually going to be pretty even Steven. But then what happens when we look at the Tachyon Lance? Well, with Tachyon Lances, armor starts becoming more of a hindrance than a help. So at equal resource costs, the Tachyon Lance fleet with armor took dramatically more losses than the hull plated fleet. Uh, as you can see from the graph here, almost the entire armored fleet was destroyed during the engagement. That's really not good. So if you're coming up against Tachyon Lances, you definitely don't want to be putting armor modules on your ship. At balanced fleet sizes, the, hu the hull fleet took more casualties, but did still win its engagement. So fighting Tachyon Lances, hull plating is definitely the way to go before you start getting repeatable stacking. Of course, you're probably going to want to have extra shields running. This is only with three shield modules. You could reduce your, uh, you could reduce your thrusters a little bit and possibly eke out a bit more of shielding that way. But overall, you're probably going to be running here crystal plating over the hull plating. But then, what happens if we take our Giga Cannon armored ship, which seems to do really well against our Giga Cannon fleet, the hull plating fleet, and we pair them up against the Tachyon Lance fleet? Well. In this case, the Tachyon Lance Fleet, which I gave some hull plating to, they lost out really quite badly to the uh, armored, the armored Giga Cannon Fleet. From the graph there, it looks pretty even Stevens, but it's important to remember that the hull plating ships, though there are more ships at the same resource cost. So looking quite even Stevens means that there's actually you're losing quite a few more battleships when you're having this type of engagement. And here we have something of a table I've been able to make so far. This is the results of my battleship engagements. And we can see from this here that the Giga Cannon is still performing really well, winning lots of engagements. And from this, it's also, I think, quite clear that the ships with the hull plating are still doing better. Of course, this is all based on equal resource cost, equal economic cost. But as you can see, you want to be running Giga Cannons. You want to be putting hull plating on them because that way when you come up against tachyon lance battle groups well you're going to completely eviscerate them and then when you come up against armored groups you're going to be in for a fair fight but that gives you a more versatile ship and of course as ever don't really run the arc emitters i've tested the arc emitters against armor as we saw in one of the uh one of the other ones against the giga cannon armored and they do win a third of the time but they're gonna take lots and lots of losses. It's uh, even against armor, it's not worth it. So on the battlefield front here, the with battleships, you want to be looking at taking the Giga Cannons with hull plating. From an economic standpoint, as I've kind of said over and over again, it's just going to be better. So the summary here overall is, armor plating is going to be better, especially in the early game. In the early game, it is really really powerful you're going to be able to get away with running much larger fleets than other empires if you can get your hands on crystalline entities and get that crystal hull plating of course if the economics isn't a problem which it really should never be not a problem you should always be looking to minimize the cost of your ships and maximize their output but if it's not a problem then yes armor is going to be better at equivalent levels if you're running exactly the same number of ships as your opponents. But that is a situation that is going to be really rare. You know, it's always going to be better to go over your fleet cap and build extra ships than to go stay under your fleet cap and build slightly more expensive ships. 
Now, on top of that as well, what else can we see? Well, as the game goes on, as you get further into the game, the effectiveness of that crystal hull plating will diminish. It will start producing diminishing returns when you start getting the neutron launchers out on the field. But even then, even with those diminishing returns, it's still really useful to have something to put on your battleships other than armor. Because the Tachyon Lance, which is a really used weapon, especially by some of the Fallen Empires and players do quite like it, but that Tachyon Lance is going to cut through armor like butter. Whereas Hull is going to stand up slightly better than the armor will. So all in all, I would recommend you run crystal plating on your ships. And then at a certain point, you're going to want to transition over to armor when you get a high enough level of repeatables. I don't know that level yet, but I hope to come back to you with that information very, very soon. This has been quite a long episode. Uh, I've had quite a lot of data and results I wanted to come across with because I think it's really important to get a good grasp on which is better at a variety of different stages and locations in the game. If you've enjoyed this episode, this video, please leave a like. If you've got any feedback for me, please leave a comment. And of course, if you'd like to see more content like this, please subscribe.